Hi, I'm Jesse Freeman. I'm the Arthur Vining Davis Fellow in Psychology. I completed my fellowship at Miami University in the Department of Social Psychology. I worked with Dr. Carrie Hall, who's the Chief Departmental Advisor and Senior Lecturer at Miami, and she's also a Cornell alum. So going into this fellowship, I wanted to conduct my own study on an aspect of social psychology that I hadn't really worked with before, but I really wanted to take the time to like explore the research process more fully because doing research on the block plan, you often like only have three and a half weeks to complete a whole project, or you might be working with like faculty members or other students, and you don't always get to maybe like do the research always the way that you want to. And I also wanted to assist Dr. Hall with anything that she needed help with while I was there and do a lot of networking, because as a first generation student, my professional network can sometimes be a little bit more limited than some of my peers. So, when I got to Miami, Carrie suggested we do work on causal uncertainty. And causal uncertainty is um, a characteristic that is different for everybody. And basically, if you are high in causal uncertainty, then you don't tend to understand why social events happen, whether they're happening to you or just around you. And we initially wanted to go with this idea that maybe uh, people that are high in causal uncertainty, there could be a relationship with uh, their use of self-trackers which are like Fitbits and other things that monitor like your heart rate and like exercise and stuff like that. And so we're going through all the causal uncertainty literature and reading all these things, but we thought we found sort of a paradox that was more interesting to us than Fitbits. And um, we found that <laughs> causal uncertainty, uh, people that are high in causal uncertainty also tend to sort of feel negatively when they can't understand something. And they'll often try to engage in some behaviors designed to alleviate the negative feelings and to make them feel more certain about things that are happening around them. But a lot of the times, the things that they do, such as just like paying more attention and trying to really like read the people and like the things going on and trying to make uh, more connections, it doesn't actually work and they don't become more certain or really feel better. And we thought that that didn't really make sense, and so we were wondering, like, why do people continue to do the same behaviors if it doesn't really do anything for them? So we left behind uh, our original ideas of looking at self-trackers and started looking into other literature and uh, discovered rumination. And uh, basically, rumination is just having a lot of, like, recurring, like, cyclical thoughts about, like, your mood and potential causes of your mood but rumination doesn't actually help people to engage in behaviors to solve their bad mood. And we thought maybe rumination might be like the answer to the paradox that we thought we found in causal uncertainty. So now that we had sort of this idea and a hypothesis and a question that we wanted to answer, I had to design the methodology, which I'd never really done before on the block plan, and I actually ended up um, creating a flow chart of how we wanted participants to go through the study in a way that I felt would answer our question. And I had to get IRB approval, which I'd also never done before. Usually uh, you don't work with humans on the block plan or your uh, faculty of <laughs> researcher does it for you. And so I had to do training, which was about eight hours of like online tests, which was fun. And I also had to fill out an application, which took much longer than I expected. And then I finally sent it in and then I just had to wait. So while I was waiting, um, Carrie and I really wanted to keep the study moving forward even while we had to wait. So. I started working with Qualtrics and actually completely made our survey on Qualtrics and connected it to Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is um, a software hosted by Amazon, which you can use to send out your survey to like a bunch of people and you can actually pay them for their time. And I started working a little bit more with SPSS, which I've done a little bit at Cornell, but Carrie wanted to make sure that um, if I collected data not at Miami, that I would still know how to analyze all of the numbers that we got when we finished. So while I was there, I also helped Dr. Hall with some of her research. She, uh, this year, took in all of the um, like new international students in the psychology department. And so she sent me some literature on uh, international student success and retention, and I helped her create some survey questions so that she could give them to her incoming international students and also her older international students to sort of see if there are any ways Miami could better help them in being successful and wanting to stay at Miami. I also got to do a lot of networking and I went into two really cool labs. I went into the biopsych lab of Dr. Matthew McMurray and got to talk to some of his undergraduate students and I got to see a lot of brains. <laughs> the brains next to McMurray are actually um, cuts of human brains and then the brains on the side are sheep brains. And I also got to see a lot of rat mazes because he does a lot of work primarily with rats. 
And I also got to go to the Smart Postural Control and Coordination Lab of Dr. L. James Smart, Jr. And that big tablet thing is actually like a touchscreen tablet that an undergraduate student just like made on an architect table. I don't know how he did it, but it's cool. And um, that right there, he, they do a lot of work with virtual reality, and so I got to see a lot of their virtual reality technology, <laughs> which was pretty cool because I've never really seen anything like that before. I also got to meet another Cornell alum that works at Miami, um, Andrea Backer. We went out to lunch with her one day. And Arthur Miller is a professor emeritus at Miami University, and he's pretty well known in the world of like, the psychology of good and evil. And he kind of just wanders around campus sometimes. And I just happened to be there while he was there one time. And he took a picture with me, and I was pretty starstruck because I'm interested in forensic and criminal psychology, and those things are pretty related. So this internship impacted me in a lot of ways. I really got to do like, research in a more professional setting, and I really got to like, take control and do research in the way that I felt that I wanted it to go. And I got to work with some new software and also got to get to know some um, other software pretty well. And I don't think I ever would have learned about causal uncertainty at Cornell because it's relatively new. I also got to meet a lot of people and really expand my networking, which was great because as a first generation student, I didn't really have one before. And I also got a lot of graduate school advice and just advice about what to do after I leave Cornell. Um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do, but then after this, I know I want to go to graduate school, but this internship really helped me realize that it's okay to like take some time off. And I wish I had some results to share with you guys, but we didn't get IRB approval until like September, I think. And we've both just been really busy since then, but the study is still ongoing, and maybe one day you guys will hear about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to thank the Arthur Vining Davis Foundation and the Cornell Fellows Program, my site mentor, Dr. Kerry Hall, my faculty sponsor, Sue Astley, and Cornell's Rise Up Program, specifically Kara Trouble, who worked here last year. Without all of them, this wouldn't have been possible. Thank you.